Okay. Uh, hello, uh, good afternoon. Uh, today I'm going to talk about uh, event sourcing principle in Rust and about me. I'm uh, Yorick and I'm a software engineer at EventStore. And uh, if I'm not hacking some code in uh, my uh, Vim editor, uh, you will probably find me uh, at the gym uh, under uh, the squat rack. So what is event sourcing? So in order to uh, answer that uh, question, I propose you to first introduce some keywords we are going to need in order to uh, go forward. And first, uh, we need to talk about what an event is. And an event is a fact of a system that happens at some time. Event, um, an event data is immutable, but an event does not have to comply to a specific template. However, we will usually uh, recommend to have at least three key properties. And those keys are the following. First, we at least need a type. Uh, a type will help us to uh, classify events uh, based off a given property, though in this case, the type. So think about type the same way you will think about type in a programming. Then we need an ID properties because it will be useful to be able to identify a given event. So it doesn't need to be uh, globally uh, unique across your system, but usually we tend to use uh, UUIDs. And lastly, uh, we need to have a date property uh, just to be able to know when the, event, when the event occurred. So we saw what an event is. I propose you now to see what a stream is. And streams are a set of events that is sorted in a timely manner. Seems, uh, streams are um, an append-only abstraction, so you can only do uh, two kinds of, of operation. First, a read, and that read can append in uh, either backward or uh, forward, and append. And because uh, it's an append-only abstraction, we can't uh, delete even in a stream. And like event stream, um, don't require to have a specific template. However, I think we, sh we, we, can, we can at least come with one, uh, at least one property, and that property should be uh, to be able to identify, to globally identify a stream. And for, sec, uh, for simplicity's sake, I propose to either call uh, that property a stream name or a stream ID. And we usually tend to have a semi-human uh, readable stream name. For example, let's say account dash followed by some random uh, UUID. So here's an example of what a stream uh, would look like. So you, you, you can see that we in phase on a, sent, a set of events that goes into one direction in this case. So account created, item added, and order sent. We saw what an event is. It's a fact in a system. A stream is a set of events. And now we'll see their uh, sibling, which are commands. Uh, commands are very similar to um, to events in the sense that they share uh, basically the same payload usually. But the main difference is, is events is about the intent to change the system. So usually when you, you want to uh, change a system, you need to validate it. And command go to uh, go through a validation process. In the end, when they, when they pass the validation process, they are promoted into an event. So the difference is purely semantic. Command is the intention to change something. Event is the proof that something has changed. So we saw events, a fact in the system. We saw stream that is a set of events. We saw a comment that is the intention to change a system. Now it's time to talk about views. And views are um, a computed um, representation of your, of your application state. And it's not the representation of 
your application state. You can have uh, multiple different views. And views are also called a uh, read model for that matter. And the view is built by reading um, streams recursively. And um, it is very, uh, view are very flexible um, at such because it, it, they are easy to change. But conversely, uh, in some situation, views can take a lot of time to build uh, when the number of events increases over time. So views use probably the oldest uh, recursion scheme of all time. And usually uh, in many programming languages, it's called a fold. So it's about a function that takes two parameters, a state, an event, and a new state. And we usually call that function a view computations. Um, a view have an initial state, and when we fed uh, when fed with events, uh, that state change over time and at each recursion step until there is uh, no uh, event to process. And the resulting state we have at the end is the view. So in Rust, you can build a view functionally or imperatively. Uh, semantically, both versions are very similar. However, the functional way offer nice perks like being able to see what has changed between uh, two transitions, whereas the imperative way tend to perform better because uh, a variety of views computation uh, perform better when using in-place mutation. Um, so we saw events, a fact in your system. A stream is a set of events, command, the intention to change the system, a view that is a computed representation of your system. But now we need to talk about the main, uh, probably the most important piece of that of an event source system, the event store. And what an event store is, an event store is basically where you put all your uh, events. Uh, and it's, it will be really difficult to uh, to come up with what exactly an event store should do. However, I think because in an event sourcing application, event store is the source, the source of truth, it's very um, paramount to be able to store your uh, event safely. And speaking of a safe event store implementation, uh, my company, uh, the company I'm working for, provide a great event store implementation named event store DB. It's a database that is built from the ground up for event sourcing. And event store DB provide uh, many um, advantages. First, it's a very active open source project. It also provide professional support services. Um, it can work in cluster if you have high availability uh, requirement. Uh, it can be access, uh, accessed through uh, many different programming languages. Uh, for example, we have C Sharp, Java, Rust, Haskell, and uh, very soon JavaScript and Go. Um, uh, also, very uh, in the very near future, um, even StoreDB uh, will um, release a multi-cloud software uh, solution as a service which uh, currently support both AWS and GCP, and later uh, it will also support Azure. And here's an example of uh, the administration uh, landing page where you can appreciate um, some runtime metrics here, and also up top a list of all the services uh, available in the database. So. Uh, here we can also have a detailed view of uh, event, um, and you can see the one of those uh, property I mentioned earlier. Uh, we have the stream name, so in this case it's account dash one two three. We know that it's the first stream of the event of the um, the first event of the stream here, uh, as the his index is zero. We can also have a look into this, its payload, where we have an ID and a name property, the type, which is item added, 
and don't don't be fooled by the timestamp. Uh, we don't we don't recommend to use timestamp as a date in your system. It's just a technical uh, date which uh, says that that uh, event has been saved at that time. So it's not really related to your application. Um, anyway, so now we uh, have introduced um, keywords um, of uh, uh, event sourcing. I, pro I propose to. Uh, implement a game and I decided to pick a famous uh, game um, it's connect 4 so um, connect 4 is a two-player connection board game in which a player choose a color and then take turns dropping colored disc uh, into seven column uh, high six row vertically suspending grid and the pieces fall straight down occupying the lowest available um, space within the column. So it's a, it's a great uh, example to uh, get your feet wet when you want to understand event sourcing. So we will do the same thing we did earlier. We're going to see what kind of event we're going to have in such game. So we, have, we will have first the game created event and that event will mark um, when a game has started. So it will have the two players that involved in the game, a date when that uh, game occurred, and an ID, because it will be useful to be able to identify uh, a game. Next, we have a token placed event. Token placed event will indicate a player made a move. For example, a player decided to play uh, the, uh, the red token at some uh, column. And in this case, we only have the color uh, of uh, the token that is being played and also the date when the, the played uh, occurred. Um, out of the gate, with only two events, we're able to derive multiple views, like being able to map all the games ever played or the state of the, the game board. And out of those views, we're able to detect if a game is over, um, the number of game played, total or related to uh, a player. So let's see what kind of comment we have. And no surprise here, we'll have two <laughs> uh, comments, which uh, the first one will be create games. And if you remember in the first part, I said that whereas uh, comment are very similar um, of events that need to be validated first. And in this case, we are going to, to deny a game, to create a game, if one of the players uh, is already involved in an ongoing game. So that will be the validation process for that command. Then uh, we are going to have the place token. And in the same way, um, we are not going to allow a player to play a token if he's going to target a column that is already full. So based on those constraints, we need to construct our views first, because in order to validate a command, we need to be able to have the current, uh, the current representation of uh, an application state. So. We're going to start with probably the, the, the simplest projection, but yet one uh, a very important one in, is to be able to project all the moves made by a player. So in this case, it, 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 uh, for every token place um, event, we are going to drop one token on the first empty uh, slot. Here. So I'm going to explain later all those uh, those slot um, uh, type. It will uh, it will uh, I will explain that in detail after that. Um, and the other uh, views will be to be able to project all the current games. And let's have a, a, um, a quick look on the right side um, of the slide, when you see that that projections um, that views uh, have to handle two different. Um, events and it's the composite uh, projection view in this case because when we have a game created event we decide to initialize uh, a game with an empty board 
and also the player the ref reference um, in the game created event. But when we have a token placed event, what we do is just to delegate that uh, event to the view uh, to the board view computation, where we project the, uh, the token places onto the board. So now we're able to project our uh, application state. We can safely implement validations. So the first validation will be to uh, check if uh, we try to create a new game, if one of our uh, players is involved in an ongoing game. So it will be very simple to do. We just we just list uh, we just go through all the games um, we have. And if that game is not over, we just check if uh, the player involved in that game are also in the new uh, game uh, creation attempt. If it's the case, then we deny the creation of the game. If not, we can go forward. Um, you also saw that there is a game over uh, validation function in the previous uh, validation function. Uh, and this is probably the most complex function uh, of, of the talk, but it doesn't need to be discussed that much because it's, it's pretty much very um, related to the game itself. But basically what we do is try to run um, to see if we have uh, four um, in a row of the same color in, in, uh, all, the, in all the possible um, disposition. So if, it's, if we find a winning condition, we just return the winner of, of, uh, of the game. If not, we say there is no winner, which means the game, can, uh, is, not, uh, the game is not over. So um, the, uh, the last validation function will be uh, to validate if a moose can be done and in this case, it's, it is very similar to the function that will project token place event. It's basically that once the action decided that the user, the player want to place um, a token at a given position, we just see if there is an empty uh, slot at that, at that position. If it's not the case, then it means uh, the column is full, then we can't play on that column. So, as you already saw earlier, we already we we uh, used uh, some models, and I want to um, to extend of those a little bit. So first, we need to introduce what a token is, and it's simple as that. It's just um, it, it just either uh, red or yellow. It is what the player used to make their moves. We have a board, and a board is um, an array of slot, and slot can be uh, can have two states, either they can be empty or occupied by a token. And we decided to go with uh, an array of a slot, mainly because uh, it's, uh, it makes uh, in place of that very uh, simple and fast, in, even if uh, performance is not a major issue, uh, it's not a, a big concern in this example. Um, and then we have the game. Uh, model and a game model is a very simple one. It's just the player involved in in that game, and the board of the game. Um, also, we also we also add uh, an ID just to be able to identify a game across uh, all the game. But you you might start to uh, wonder about how that that differ from a, a regular application. And you will be right because. Most of the code uh, I've shown uh, so far is probably very similar to any regular application you're going to write, right? And so what is event sourcing then? And event sourcing is really uh, a, simple uh, a simple part of your application. And it's just to ensure that all the changes that, uh, that happen into an application are stored as a sequence of events. And you can see here the main differences between an event source application and a mainstream application. So in an event sourcing application, a state is computed. We also say it projected, so it's transient. Whereas in a mainstream application, the state is usually serialized, then persisted into as a persistent layer. 
So when we uh, when we do major uh, updates in event source application, we tend to say we do event migration, whereas in a mainstream application, we tend to do state migration. And state migration all, uh, usually um, involve schema migrations. Also in event source um, application, uh, in event source application, there is no data leakage, meaning we keep all the history that uh, ever happened. Uh, in um, an event store in, uh, in the application, whereas uh, in mainstream, in an in a mainstream application, we lost um, why the the, the state is uh, value because we lost the history because every time we try to to change something, we just do a destructive update. And it's also the same story with error connection because error error can happen. And in an event source application, we go, uh, we use what we call compensation events. Uh, and in that sense, try to think about what Git revert does because it's the same, uh, the same principle. Whereas in a mainstream application, we usually uh, go through a destructed update to, to, to fix um, errors. So let's get back to our game and try to see how we're going to implement uh, command processing. So command processing, as I said, a command, because uh, it's just signal, signals um, an intent to change the system, we need to, uh, to check if the command is valid. And as you saw uh, earlier with the function we implemented, when we, um, when we have a create game, we just check that we're able to create that game. And if we can create that game, we just return an event. In the same time, if we have a place token, if it's a valid move, then it means we can return a token place. So you, you see that we we tend to um, to handle command individually, but we can also return more than one event. But in this case, we just return one. But it doesn't need to be that way. You can you can return how how many events you want, and it's the same thing. It's almost the same thing with event processing, but the main difference is is um, is, um, is uh, related to the differences between a command and an event. Because in this case, an event already occurred. We don't need to um, to do any kind of validation. So when we have an event, we just apply it as face value, because the event the the validation has been have been already um, already been done. Uh, up front. So if we put everything together, um, you can see how we can um, integrate um, our command process, uh, our command or event uh, processor. And as a general rule, I really uh, recommend to uh, to have your external dependencies outside of your um, command or event processor. And what I mean by even, uh, external dependencies is, is uh, how you are going to, to uh, produce a command or how you are going to persist your event. The idea is to improve uh, testability at the utmost. And usually, it's easier to abstract over how you're going to uh, obtain a dependency and just uh, return any output of your processing as a result of your function. So if you have an external dependency, use uh, pass it as a functional uh, as a function parameters. And if you got a process outcome, let it just be uh, a function return. So what is the benefit of using events? Well, it's time traveling mostly. Mostly. Um, if you use when you use events, you can start at any point in time because remember we uh, advise you to use time in your um, in your event payloads. So you can start either in the beginning of your stream, but you can also start at any point uh, in the stream. You can rebuild the entire the entire application state at any given time, which is really practical if you know a, a bug happened and you want to know what was the state of the application at that time. Also, the logic remain in the code and not in the persistent layer, because usually when you tend to uh, serialize the application state, you lost the code that caused that change. Whereas in 
an event source application because you only store data, you are sure that you have the history of the code that uh, produced uh, such event, and you just have to look into your source control uh, software to do that. It's also very easy, uh, it is also easier to do regression testing because if you roll out a new version, um, one way of uh, testing if, if everything is working as it used to be is to run all the command you previously uh, handled and see if it leads to the same outcome. If it does, it means there is no uh, regression. So how does this translate into Connect4 games? So by being able, by using events, we can, in that game, we can replay a game step by step and we can do it forward or backward. A player could also return at a point where a mistake was made. So think about it. Imagine you, 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 you had a, a game and you don't exactly remember it, uh, which time uh, things uh, went astray and you want to go back at that time and probably change what you did and see what, what will, will come if you have done that move. Um, we can also create a game based on a move of other games, which will be, uh, will, will, which will ease, for example, training, because because you can train certain situations, so it will make everything, uh, every feature like this, uh, simpler to implement. So that's basically magic. At least that's how I see it, because it is very powerful. For example, when you uh, if if one of your uh, user or whatever um, want to uh, to uh, to know, okay, but what happened if I changed um, uh, a, a rule in our business rule? It will be it will be very impressive if I could uh, apply that new rule based on older events that predate that rule. And usually, um, mainstream application don't have that luxury. So that's a really uh, nice uh, setting point. But uh, that doesn't mean that event sourcing is a silver bullet. It's not foolproof, so it's very easy to shoot yourself on your foot. And because of uh, event sourcing um, flexibility, it's very easy to let you to uh, to be carried away and to over engineer uh, your solution. So you have to, to, uh, to, to be mindful of that. And you also live with your past mistake with insourcing. I want to, um, to be precise here. Um, uh, every time you change uh, reach production, um, it means that event will be generated with, um, with po pos uh, potentially uh, bad codes. So, in an event source application, those events will stay will stay there. So you have to live with it and make those adjustments in your code. Whereas in a mainstream application, if you if you saw you did a really bad mistake, usually you can put everything under the rug and just uh, uh, do some destructive updates. So keep that in mind. So to go further about event sourcing, I also uh, um, gathered other topic to extend your, um, uh, your uh, discovery of the event sourcing uh, uh, theme. So something that will uh, happen very recently when you, uh, that will happen at some time when designing an event source solution will be about uh, event versioning because your system will uh, um, um, change over time and you will still have to maintain previous event of your system. So uh, I really uh, advise you to look into event uh, versioning. There is also uh, domain-driven design, which use event sources at its core, but add a more uh, catered, uh, uh, tailored design uh, based on your um, domain application. Um, we also got common query responsibility segregation, CQRS, where we try to uh, separate our read application from our write application. And one um, benefit is to um, to have better time um, to up to to be able to optimize your application based of those requirements. So, for example, you will tend to optimize read application because you know they only do reading. 
and maybe you will uh, lower um, the power usage of your write model because you figure out you don't write in that much. And oh, sorry. And there is also event modeling, which is uh, basically um, probably a, a more straightforward uh, design than domain-driven uh, design, and it also event storming. But most of this topic has been um, discussed by Greg Young. Uh, so it will be very easy for you to look uh, into those informations. Um, and also, we at Even Store hiring. So here's a list of uh, the available vacancies we have. So hopefully, um, maybe uh, you'll be my next coworker uh, to join the team. And if you need to have more information about those uh, positions, please uh, follow the link below here. And uh, that's all for me. So uh, if you have any questions, uh, just uh, go forward. Thank you very much, Yorick. It was a very interesting session. And uh, we do have some questions from the community here. And firstly, Rust is not a very well-known language, it's not very popular in Mauritius. And do you have any tips for people who want to get started with Rust? Oh. Oh yeah, um, I mean, m me personally, the way I um, I learned Rust was to pick something I uh, I like to do, and at that time, I like to write uh, even store client code. So because I already made an an ASCII client install DB, I said, oh, let's make a, a Rust client and see how the language uh, works. So personally, I will, I will, I will advise to do that. Usually, uh, as a Dave uh, enthusiast, we have um, some tasks we really like to do. So I will, I will recommend to pick something you already know and try to do it in Rust, because at least you will only have to focus on the language itself and not about um, about knowing maybe a new uh, domain, an entire domain, in order to make any progress. Thank you, Yorick. That was an awesome presentation. You handled the English perfectly. Uh, I would like to ask a question myself. Uh, uh, can you tell us about real life examples where events uh, of re event sourcing applications? Oh yeah, for sure. I mean. Or maybe I can I can pick uh, one I did in my previous job where uh, I was working uh, in a company uh, that um, delivered parcels. Uh, it was a, a e e market company. So basically, we had users that bought um, commodities on the website, and we just shipped those commodities after. And my application was dealing with uh, the state of uh, those um, those commands. So we got the whole history of the command, like when the when the purchase has been made, then how it will be dealt with uh, the um, logistic uh, subsystems, and we organized everything into streams, so it was easy to have the full history and to, de to derive uh, multiple uh, statistics, like how many times that command has, uh, took to be processed. And um, yeah, I think that's the bulk of the, of the example. Uh, there is also uh, other, um, other example that comes to mind. Uh, for example, mm, which one I got in my head? Uh, because I mean, the, the the most the most recent example I have is the example I just gave uh, at my previous job. Probably I would like to think about more uh, real life example now. Uh, but yeah, in my previous job, it was really good fit uh, because we could do so many stuff like uh, a projection about the the current sto uh, stock of um, of one um, of of one item, for example. Uh, we could also detect how many anomalies occurred uh, based on the type of um, the type of cells that happens because each cell uh, was uh, different, so it was not uh, carried out the same way other uh, other cell are. 
So that's why it was really nice to be able to uh, derive in so many different ways uh, the same um, process. Thank you. So thank you. We do have some more questions coming in, in the chat. And firstly, Rangan is asking, uh, why choose, did you choose Rust? And uh, what about languages like NIM, C? NIM? Okay, uh, uh, um, the first reason will be uh, quite obvious. It's just because I happen to like Rust, uh, even if my favorite language is probably Haskell. Um, why I didn't pick Nim instead? Uh, it will be uh, easy to answer. It's just because I only uh, know uh, Nim uh, just because I follow one guy on Twitter that, that talk about it maybe two times and made a presentation about it. So I don't know too much about uh, Nim actually, uh, but to be honest, I always I also thought about implementing an event store client on it <laughs> because that's usually what I try to do when I try to learn a new language. Uh, but we'll see. But there is no, uh, I mean, I didn't pick uh, Rust uh, other than just because I like the language. I could have picked another language for that matter, and just I thought maybe there will be some uh, interest about such topic with Rust. That's all. Thank you. And uh, the next question would be, uh, how would you compare event-driven uh, versus event sourcing? Um, uh, so I, I need maybe more information here. When you say event-driven, what, what, what it entails exactly? Uh, because uh, uh, even with event sourcing, people tend to come with their own definition. So uh, I will need uh, what uh, event-driven in this case means precisely. Okay. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll see if there's any follow-up in the chat regarding that. So more information about what it means by event-driven. Okay. And one more question. Uh, how does event store compare to the solutions such as Axon? Uh, such as what? Uh, Axon or Axon? A-X-O-N? A-X-O-N. Uh... To be honest, I don't know what Axon uh, is, uh, so uh, it will be hard for me to to give um, to, to give an answer here. But uh, I take note because I never came across that name. So you say it spells A X O N O N. Okay, I will look into it because honestly, I don't I don't know uh, that product. Uh, so maybe uh, maybe maybe there is a, uh, the same question for a different backend maybe uh, because I, I, maybe I could pr provide some answer uh, with something I know <laughs> at the re-release. Okay, there's a, a little technical question. Yeah. Uh, does event sourcing scale over millions of requests per second? Uh, it, it does if you, you do it properly. Uh, as I said uh, earlier, event sourcing is not um, a golden solution that will make a bad design into a great design. If your design is bad, it will still be bad using event sourcing. So we will, uh, being able to scale um, on millions of requests per second, it will need to be designed properly. And that's something that is beyond event sourcing itself. Event sourcing is more about being able to express your state as uh, a sequence of events and there is more, no more than that the performance relying to it comes from your design decision because uh, as i uh, i said uh, in um, uh, earlier views for example tend to take more time as um, the number of event increases so you have to to be uh, um, inventive in order to overcome uh, that. For example, you can use a snapshot, for example, where you have an already serialized uh, version of your application and you just start um, at a different point of the event just to not have to recompute everything from scratch. So yeah, that's, that's I think that's something that is uh, beyond event sourcing itself. It's a more, uh, uh, a more uh, a design so a design talk, not an event source talk, because as I said, event store, event sourcing is not a magic pill here. You still need to be to do a good work. <laughs> uh, I saw a question here, uh, and we do have a little follow up about the event driven thing. So uh, he did mean uh, the difference between an event driven architecture and event sourcing. 
Uh, can you repeat the, the, the first part of the question? Uh, so to compare between uh, event-driven architecture and event sourcing. Mm. Um, to be honest, I would have to know what that entails, but let, let's just, let's try to, uh, let, I will try to, yeah. uh, to answer that question. I mean, f for me, what makes event sourcing, uh, event sourcing is to be able to replay the event in the same way they happened uh, before. So as long as, I, I will say the main difference if there is, is how those events have uh, been produced. Can in an event-driven uh, uh, architecture, can I still replay my event in the same way, for example, or not? Or because I, I think maybe maybe I'm wrong here, but it, it looks like a question related for something like Kafka, for example, which use events, but I will not uh, qualify uh, using Kafka as event sourcing mainly because it's a broker. So you, the only guarantee you will have uh, when um, dealing event with Kafka will be based on um, uh, how say that. Um, a shard, so the order is not guaranteed across the entire cluster, uh, uh, Kafka cluster. So you have to leak, for example, a lot of implementation details into your code in order to reproduce the same order. Whereas in an even source uh, application um, architecture, it's the the main the main property is to be able to replay the event the same way they occurred. It's not the only way to read those events, obviously. But that's a major, a major uh, property is to be able to replay those even in the same order, without having to to be to leak your implement your event store in implementation into your code, which will be the case if you try to do the same thing with Kafka, for example. So uh, m maybe I think it's a, a, a question related to Kafka. So maybe you should try to ask that person that because it, it sounds like it. But if it is, uh, for me, it's not the same thing. Because in the one way, it's not about notifying uh, a system about a change. It's being able to to create a system based on reading the all the event that happened uh, during the application uh, lifecycle. Okay. Thank you very much. We are nearly at the we are nearly uh, finished with the session. So I hope I, I was able to uh, answer the last question correctly because I, I mean it's very difficult to not be able to to be live yeah. with the person, but I, I, I try to be my to do my best. But just in case, I also mentioned my Twitter handler uh, in the beginning of the talk. So feel free to uh, ping me there, and I will gladly uh, extend that conversation uh, down there. Yeah. Thank you very much for your time. Was uh, very thank you for having me. And yep, hope we see you soon in one of our other events. And bye bye. Yeah, bye bye. Have a great day.